Hey, if you don't have a Bible on the tables in the back, there is a Bible. It's our gift to you. I want you to have that, uh, read that, live in that. Uh, if, if you're new to Story Church, we've been, uh, for the first month of the year so far, we've been walking through the book of Galatians. It's our regular pattern at Story Church to just preach verse by verse through books of the Bible. And so uh, we have titled the book of Galatians, Set Free. Uh, because it is through the finished work of Jesus that you and I are set free in the gospel uh, to live for him. And so uh, today, the sermon from uh, verses 11 through 14 of chapter 2 is titled Gospel Inconsistencies. Gospel Inconsistencies. Now, if we could be honest, you and I are inconsistent people. We say one thing and we mean another. We say one thing and we do another thing. We say one thing to one person and we say another thing to another person. We are inconsistent people. Now, one of my favorite inconsistencies um, uh, is, is like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get healthy and we're going to watch our finances. So we're going we're gonna to eat at home this year. And then I go to, over to your house and I look in the trash bin. There's nothing but Chick-fil-A trash wrappers everywhere. And it's like, not only is that the most overpriced meal on the face of the earth, it's also fried. So it's not healthy. We are inconsistent in that way. Now, that's just a joke, right? Um, there are greater issues at hand than mediocre chicken. The, the greater issues at hand here that we see in Galatians is the issue of getting the gospel right in both belief and behavior. You see, there's two ways that we can be inconsistent when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can be inconsistent when it comes to the wrong belief, okay? We talk about this all the time. We hit the, the, the right and true gospel the first month of Galatians on repeat that the gospel of Jesus Christ is by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. If we add or subtract anything from the gospel, we get into wrong belief territory, and that's dangerous territory. But that's not the only way you and I can be inconsistent when it comes to the gospel. We can also have wrong behavior. Getting your beliefs right, but refusing to work those beliefs out in real time. So I know that the Bible teaches me that the tongue is dangerous and that gossip is sin, and yet I consistently walk in that, even though I know it's not the way. That the gospel tells me that I must major in the majors and on, on the minors, we don't need to divide over those things, and yet we do it anyways. What we have here in this text this morning that Scott just read for us is Peter knowing the right beliefs of the gospel, but having the wrong behavior. He was inconsistent when it came to the gospel. And this is not a minor and flippant thing. If you look at verse uh, 13, he, it says that Barnabas and the rest of the group was being led astray by Peter's inconsistencies. To be led astray is literally put on the path to death. This is no minor issue. Our consistency in the gospel in both belief and behavior is a very serious thing. And so what we're going to do this morning, just kind of the outline is we're gonna walk through the background of what's going on in this episode here because this episode happens in Antioch, not in Galatia. I wanna summarize the verses for us. I wanna point out the inconsistencies of Peter and then I wanna talk about how the gospel frees us to be a consistent people. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna do a fair amount of background work so we can understand this episode, why Paul and Peter have such conflict here. So if you look at verse 12 with me, it says, certain men came from James. Okay, stop right there. James was the half-brother of Jesus, and uh, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ as well, and he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And of all the apostles, um, if I could say it this way, James was perhaps the most uh, Jewish of the apostles. What I mean by that is James, even though he was a believer in Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, James still remained bound by his conscience to continue to walk in the Old Testament laws of Judaism. What we have in, in this text, though, is that Peter, also a Jewish apostle, was not bound by his conscience to continue to walk in the Old Testament laws. He's eating with Gentiles, something a Jewish person would never do. 
And so as Peter is eating with these Gentile Christians in Antioch, he sees a group from James, so his disciples, they are checking up on the church at Antioch. He sees them from a distance. He gets up, he leaves them in the lurch, and he abandons them. Now, why does Peter abandon them? Well, there's a couple of reasons why. Let me give a little bit more background around that. Um, the table. In the Bible, the table and table fellowship was not just going to Haven City Marketplace after church and enjoying a meal together. It was an intimate affair. When you welcome someone around the table, you were communicating to that person belonging and community and a sense of family. I mean, think about this. When, when, when I have like a, a solar panel salesman going door to door through my neighborhood, I, I'm just like, you know what? You're staying on the porch, okay? We already got solar panels. We're good there. You're staying there. But if it's one of you all, I'm like, come on in. Right, You go from the, the doorway into the foyer, into the living room, and ultimately to the table, which is one of the most intimate places of our homes. We are communicating belonging and community and family when we eat a meal with someone. And this is why Jesus, in the gospel accounts, is labeled by the Pharisees a friend of sinners. It's because he is consistently reclining around a table, eating meals with tax collectors and sinners. And when Jesus was doing that, he wasn't just simply sharing some hummus and pita with them. Instead, what he is saying is my kingdom and my gospel is big enough for tax collectors and sinners to come in by faith. The table was a place of intimacy. And Peter, in this episode, again, he is in Antioch. This is important. Antioch was the third largest kind of metro area of ancient Rome, and it was a place of lots of perversion and lots of paganism. And so Peter, when he is eating with these Gentiles in this particular place, he is communicating that the, the gospel makes a place of belonging for the worst of the worst. The second reason why uh, he would abandon the Gentiles is not just the table, but it's also the cleanliness laws of the Old Testament. Okay, so there was a lot of laws in the Old Testament. A couple of them um, that are important is the kosher laws. So don't eat pork, don't eat shellfish, so on and so forth. Peter uh, would have, if, if he would have been seen by these Jewish apostles of James, he would have been breaking the kosher laws. And not just that, but the cleanliness laws, hand washing which rituals. We'll call them. That if you were around, let's say, a woman who was menstruating or a leper or a Gentile, you had to go through all of these steps before you sat down at a table and you would be clean enough to eat of the food. And so Peter is, is clearly not obeying those laws and he is communicating at the table to these Gentiles from Antioch that you are welcome into the kingdom of Jesus. And he doesn't want to be seen by a bunch of zealot Jewish Christians eating with a bunch of Roman Gentile Christians. And he doesn't want to be seen at such an intimate moment, and he doesn't want to be seen eating some carnitas with them. But Peter and Paul and the group of James knew this was out of step with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Flip with me in your Bibles over to Acts chapter 10, okay? And again, if you didn't bring a Bible, the, the tables in the back will have that for you. Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1, and I'm going to cover 10 through 15 here, and I'm going to try and fly through it, and we're going to have a, a longer sermon this morning. We're just going to deal with it, okay? Verse 1 of Acts chapter 10 says this. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Stop right there. What you need to read into that text is that Cornelius and his family were Gentiles. They were Italian, and not only that, but they worked for the man, so to speak. He was in the military, and he was powerful in the military. And in chapter 10, verses 2 through 8, Cornelius gets a vision from the Lord, and he says, you need to go to this place. There's going to be a man there named Peter, and Peter is going to tell you the truth of the gospel. And then in verses 9 through 16, Peter himself will get a vision from the Lord. And in this vision, just to summarize it, there's a tray of, of food that descends. And on that tray of food, there was all of those things that break the kosher laws, okay? So you got that carnitas, you got that bacon, right? You got that shrimp cocktail. That's all on that tray. And, and God says to Peter in his vision, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter, 
the ever audacious Peter speaks back to the Lord and says, by no means, that's, that's, I can't do that. That's breaking the law. That's unclean. And, and the Lord speaks back to Peter and says, do not call unclean what I have declared clean. Look at verse 16. 15, I I mean. And the voice came to him again, Peter, a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once. The Lord is making clear, this isn't just about food. This is also about people. And in verse 28, uh, the, the, you know, the rest of the verses, Peter and, and Cornelius meet, and, and they begin to build a relationship. And look at verse 28 with me. And Peter said to them, Cornelius and his people, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And then the rest of chapter 10 Peter ends up preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his family. They repent of their sins. The Holy Spirit descends on them. And Peter says, go and get baptized, okay? So God is already making clear that the gospel is for every tribe, tongue, and nation. It is for all peoples, and we must not call anyone unclean if he has declared them clean. Now look at verse 11, chapter uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So word spreading, okay? Gentiles are in. The Holy Spirit dwells in them. They're getting baptized as well. Now look at verse 2. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, the same group of people as the group of James, were saying, criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. They're already accusing him of being with unclean people. Now jump down in chapter 11. I'm gonna skip some verses. Go to verse 17 with me. 17 and 18 says this. If then God gave the same gift, that's the Holy Spirit, to them, the Gentiles, as he gave to us, the Jews, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, the circumcision party, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, here it is, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. In other words, Peter and James and the circumcision party and everyone in Jerusalem agrees the Gentiles are in. The Holy Spirit dwells in them as he dwells in us. And then in verses or chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14, the mission continues to go forth to the Gentile world. And then we flip over to chapter 15. Go to chapter 15 of Acts with me. I love that sound. Page is flipping. I love it. Chapter 15, read verses one and two with me. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. In other words... What's happening in Galatia is happening in Antioch, and it's happening all throughout these new churches that are being planted. The essence of the question being asked is, do you have to become a Jew before you become a Christian? And already, they've answered it in chapter 11. The Holy Spirit is evidence enough. He dwells in you. You're in. Jesus is enough. You do not need to be circumcised in order to be saved. But then Paul and Barnabas, they go up to Jerusalem and they begin what's called the Jerusalem Council where the key leaders and apostles of the early church gather together and they debate the question of what you need to do to be saved. Look at verse six. We're gonna go through 11. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, brothers, You know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? 
But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter throws the hammer down. It is by grace, through faith, that you come to salvation, and that's it. We need not throw a burden or a yoke on them to say you got to do this and Jesus in order to get saved. And the rest of chapter 15 is the Jerusalem Council coming to the same conclusion, that it is by grace, through faith, in Christ, to the glory of God alone. That is salvation. That is it. Okay? Now, with all that background in mind, flip back over to Galatians 2 with me. And remember, this is Peter. Peter, that's Cephas in verse 11, is the same name as Peter. He is the one who is being inconsistent. He knows right belief. He knows it's the gospel alone, not the customs of Moses, in order to be saved. And yet his behavior is inconsistent. At the end of the day, what the Jerusalem council decided was this. If Jews that are Christians want to remain Jewish in their obedience, if they feel bound by their conscience to not eat pork and not eat shellfish, that's okay. They can do that with two caveats. Number one, they don't bind anyone else to that. And number two, they understand that obeying those laws does not save them. Okay, that's what the Jews had to understand. On the other hand, the Gentile Christians had to understand that they are freed by the gospel to eat pork with two caveats. They do not require Jews to eat it if they don't want to, and they also understand that eating bacon doesn't save you, okay? What they all needed to come to the conclusion of is that our conscience is different than salvation. Jesus saves us, and then we work out our salvation with fear and trembling in order to honor God. So if Jews wanted to keep on not eating pork, that's okay. If they wanted to eat pork now, that's also okay. If Gentiles wanted to refuse pork or eat pork, that's okay. And all of this matters because Peter is leading people astray. So that's the background to this episode, Peter and Paul. Now, let me summarize these verses for us very quickly. In this, in this episode, in verses 11 through 14 of Galatians 2, we have seven kind of steps of what's going on here. Let me fly through those. The first step, Peter comes to Antioch and he begins to eat with the Gentiles, all right? He's not bound by his conscience to stay away from them. Number two, certain men from James came to Antioch. Number three, Peter becomes afraid of this group. Number four, his fear causes him to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles. Number five, the rest of the Jews and Barnabas, Paul's partner, withdraw alongside Peter and join him in his hypocrisy. Number six, because of this, Peter stood condemned. That is guilty of wrong behavior. And the final step to this is that Paul rebukes Peter to his face. Paul gives his assessment of the situation and the content of his rebuke. His behavior is out of sync with the gospel and it is inconsistent with Peter's own life commitments and belief. So why, my question is, why does Paul place this Antioch episode in this church, in this letter to the church at Galatia? Well, if you remember to when Pastor Chris spoke last week, there was a Titus situation. Titus was a Gentile Christian who would go on to be a pastor, and he was uncircumcised. And the early church was arguing, does he need to be circumcised? Does he not need to be circumcised? And they came to the conclusion that he doesn't need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. And Paul is using this situation with Peter as a highlight that it is not through the law that you are saved. It is through the gospel that you are saved, and that is it. So what is the gospel? John Piper says this. The gospel is the good news that the privilege of getting right with God was purchased fully when Christ died for our sins and rose again, and that the only way to enjoy this privilege is to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. That's it. Titus believed this. He was in Gentile Christians believed this. They were in. Jewish Christians believed this. They were in. And everything downhill from that is freedom in Christ. But Peter's getting some stuff wrong here. 
So I'm gonna spend some time talking about the inconsistencies that we see in Peter's life and maybe we see in our own life and in our own church. Let's look at these inconsistencies. Look back at verse 12 with me. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, Peter drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Okay, why? What was the motivation for Peter stepping back? Fear. He feared the circumcision party. The first gospel inconsistency of Peter, and maybe of us, is the fear of man. The fear of man. The fear of man motivates Peter to leave his gospel beliefs behind. So what is the fear of man? John Bunyan, in his little book, Fear of God, is helpful. He says this, The fear of man is the fear of losing man's favor, love, goodwill, help, and friendship. In other words, the fear of man is this little idol we call approval, people-pleasing, doing whatever we can to make people like us and never lose that. Bending over backwards and bending in our beliefs in order to have the approval of those around us. Peter seeks the approval in the eyes of James and his folks back in Jerusalem, and he was willing to abandon the Gentiles and the gospel in the process. And before I laugh at Peter, because I do that all the time when I read the Bible, I'm often reminded of how much fear of man motivates my own life. I get to do a fair amount of traveling, and I don't know about you, but when I get on an airplane, my typical tactic is this. Get on early, get to my chair, throw headphones in, put a hood on, and act like I don't exist and no one else around me exists, okay? I talk all day long. When I get on an airplane, I don't wanna do that. But the Lord, in his kindness, always seems to place the most talkative person on the plane (laughs) right next to me, okay? And so you start having a conversation, you know, and, and then I can sense from the spirit in those moments, like, man, this person's spiritually primed and ready. Like, we're gonna, we're gonna go there. We're gonna have this conversation. And, and then the fear of man begins to crop up. And I'm like, oh, man, I want this guy to like me. I don't want him to, like, shut me down or, you know, call me a bigot or, or anything like that. So I, I shirk back on preaching the gospel to him, motivated by the fear of man. It's like, let's just talk about sports and weather because that's easy. And the fear of man is what's motivating that. How does fear of man manifest in our lives? How does it manifest in your life? Is it coming in here on Sundays, claiming Christ as Lord, then going into the workplace or neighborhood and refusing to live for him? Is it constantly building relationships with those who are outside of the faith, but never taking the next step into saying, you gotta repent and follow Jesus? We refuse to do that, motivated by fear of man. Now, why was Peter's fear of man out of step with the gospel? Why is it inconsistent with the gospel? The scriptures tell us that the fear of man is a snare and that the fear of God is the way into wisdom. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of power and love and self-control. Romans 8, 31 through 39 tells us what can separate us from the Lord and from his love. Can people, can tribulation, can all of these things under the sun separate us from Jesus? No, nothing, not even man can separate us from Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors through him. Hebrews 13 says, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? So if we truly believe the gospel and we're working out the gospel in real time, it frees us up with boldness and courage when it comes to others so that we can freely share the gospel with them, freely build life with them. When we have fear of man, God is small and people are big. When we have the fear of God, people are small and God is big. We must live in light of that. The second inconsistency in Peter's life is hypocrisy. Look at verse 13 with me. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, that's Peter, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy was mentioned twice in there from Barnabas and Peter and all of the Jews in this situation. A hypocrite in the ancient world was simply an actor, someone who put on a mask, went on stage, and played a part, but it was not their true identity. 
In other words, what Paul is saying about Peter and Barnabas and the others is that they were two-faced. They had two identities. They were hypocrites. When they were with the Gentiles, they were cool with them. But as soon as the Jews showed up, the Gentiles didn't exist anymore. They had two identities. One of the moments in my life that has marked me the most is, um, comes from my senior year of high school. I, I came to faith somewhere around uh, the summer before my senior year of high school. And I had grown up playing baseball with a guy named Luke. And all through high school, we hung out all the time. We played baseball together. And, and he knew that I had come to faith. And, and I had begun sharing with him about my conversion and my following of Jesus and what it means to follow Jesus. And and, and then one day, I remember at baseball practice, we were both pitchers, so that meant we didn't really practice. We just kind of stood around waiting for the next game to come. And, uh, and so we were standing around in the outfield shagging fly balls, and he was like, man, I just, I gotta tell you something. And I'm paraphrasing here because we were kids, so it wasn't this mature. Um, hey, man, I gotta tell you something. On, on Sundays, you profess Jesus, but on Monday through Saturday, nothing's changed about your life. The way you speak how you act, the people you associate. Like you're telling me to follow Jesus, but I don't see any distinction in your life from my life. And that rocked my world because that's hypocrisy, friends. That was two identities. And hopefully I'm a little less of a hypocrite now by God's grace. What gives you your worth? What is your true identity? If you take the hypocritical mask off, who are you? Galatians 2.20 tells us Christ was crucified for us and it is no longer us who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. The defining characteristic of your life, your identity, is that you belong to Jesus and his spirit dwells in you. So in this case, Peter is not sometimes Jewish when the Jews are around and sometimes Gentile when the Gentiles are around. He is always someone who belongs to Jesus. At the end of his life, Peter will know this. As he denies Jesus three times and he's restored three times, he experiences the grace and mercy of Jesus in such a way that he knows I belong to Jesus and that's who I am. That's the totality of my being. Paul knows this. Paul went from a persecutor to a pastor. He belongs to Christ. Barnabas, Titus, James, the group of James, the circumcision party, if they follow Jesus, their primary identity is I belong to Jesus. And you, if you've turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus, your primary, your only, the totality of your identity is that you belong to Jesus. But how often are we hypocritical? where we begin to change our identity depending on situations. What do we allow to change our identity? Is it past sins that we walk in shame over? Is it present accomplishments that we get puffed up chests over? Is it future aspirations that we sacrifice everything to try and achieve? Is it how much money we have, what political party we belong to, what educational degrees we have on our wall, what ethnicity and people group we come from? What is it that we allow to change our identity? I mean, think about this. You're in here, and so I'm guessing you love and want to follow Jesus. Does that loving and following Jesus translate to 9 a.m. tomorrow morning? Does it translate to Tuesday night at 7 p.m.? Does it translate to Friday night at 7 p.m.? Are you a different person here than you are at work tomorrow? Are you a person who gladly sings of the joy of the Lord wherever you go, but the second you get in your little group outside of this gathering, it's just like grumble, 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 grumble. Right? Are we hypocrites? Are we two-faced? The reason why we become that way is we begin to add something other than Jesus to our identity. We begin to lose our way and act as hypocrites because Christ is no longer ruling us. But hear me, church, the gospel tells us that the death of Christ assures us of God's love to us, and it also gives us a deep root of stability and security in our lives. More than that, the sheer beauty and power of Christ's resolve to suffer for me instead of putting up a front to save his own skin shames me in my fear of man and my inclination to play a hypocrite in order to avoid suffering. Center your life on Jesus and his gospel and the root of hypocrisy will be severed. 
The final inconsistency we see here from Peter is legalism. We've covered this at length in Galatians, but look at verse 14 with me. But when I saw, when Paul saw there, Peter, Barnabas, their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, I said to Peter before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? The key word there at the end of the verse is that word force. It can also be translated as compel. How, Peter, can you compel Gentiles to live as Jews when you, a Jew, will, not, will live like a Gentile? That word force or compel is the same thing as the word legalism. Asking the question, how can you compel, how can you put a yoke or a burden on someone else other than Jesus Christ crucified in order to be saved? And the answer is, you can't do that. What Christ has declared clean, you cannot make unclean again. Who Christ has made right, you cannot make wrong. And I think in some ways, we do this. In many ways, really, especially in local churches. I saw uh, this comment in a commentary as I was studying this week, and I, I found it funny in a tragic sense because I realized We've walked through these firsthand. All of us probably have. We put yokes of legalism on other people, and it goes like this. Like, if you go on mission trips, man, you're a super Christian. If you don't, ah, you got to do that to get there. Right? You give a certain amount of money, man, you're in the kingdom. You don't, you're out. You drink in moderation, okay, ah, no, you're out. You're a teetotaler, that's Christian. You follow certain preachers and pastors and ministries, you're a true faithful one. You follow someone else, you're out. You listen to certain music, like the list goes on and on and on, where we take wisdom and conscience and obedience decisions and we make them salvific. Where the Jews, man, they they wanted to say, we're going to continue to get circumcised and we're going to obey the kosher laws. And that's fine if they would have stayed there. But the second they stepped over the bounds and said, you got to do that in order to be a Christian, that's when they became legalistic. Friends, if you have wisdom issues or conscience issues and you're wrestling with those through the word of God and you want to honor the Lord and the Holy Spirit is leading you and guiding you, you have freedom in Jesus to make those decisions. You may not compare compel anyone else to follow them. Legalism is another inconsistency with the gospel. So, what do we learn from this episode? The gospel sets us free to be a consistent people. We have freedom to be consistent. Because we all, like Peter, struggle with fear of man and hypocrisy and legalism, I think this episode is simply a case study for our lives And I think there's three lessons we can learn from this of how Christ has freed us up to be a consistent people. The first lesson, we have freedom to have unity. Freedom to have unity. The alternate avenue to this situation is that all these people could have gone on with unity where our freedom in Christ allows it. You see, neither the Jews nor the Gentiles needed to require anything outside of Jesus' blood for salvation. Okay, so if the Jews wanted to eat pork and they loved and followed Jesus, good. If they didn't, good. If Gentiles wanted to eat pork and they believed Jesus was enough, good. If they didn't want to eat pork, good. Hear me, church, differences and divisions are not the same. You see, again, the Jews could have kept on obeying the kosher laws and the Gentiles could have kept on eating pork chops and they could have had those differences and stayed united around Jesus Christ. But we're not dealing with kosher laws in our church, right? We all love pork in this room. Most of us love pork in this room. (laughs) But we have all of these examples, right? Homeschool, let's talk about it, okay? Okay? Katie and I choose to homeschool. That's our conviction. That's our conscience. That's where it's led us. We don't know if it's going to be there next year or the year after. Some of you choose public school. Some of you choose private school. Hear me. If you're praying and you're seeking the Lord and the Spirit, make that choice. Homeschooling is a way, not the way. Do you understand me? Okay? Church structure, church preferences, okay? 
oh, I want the church to be structured this way, we gotta do this, we gotta do that, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. Listen, if the word is preached, we're taking communion, we're baptizing people, we're seeking fellowship and prayer, we're doing the things. Everything else is preferential. And as soon as we elevate preferences to standards, friends, we are creating division where there's simply differences. You see, what division does is it takes the adjectives of your life and makes it the noun. Adjectives describe aspects of your life. Who you, nouns are who you are in your being. Okay, think about this. God is love. God is holy. That's a noun. God has kindness. God has grace. That's an adjective. I get all this from Tony Evans, by the way. Depending on the situation Peter was in, he chose which adjective became his noun. The group of James was around. I become a Jew. They're not around. I become a Gentile. When all along his noun should have been and should always have been, I am a blood-bought, redeemed child of God through the work of a risen Savior. That's it. And that never changed. Unity in a church comes when we are united on the nouns and we don't let the adjectives create division. So let's talk about race. I am a white Christian. Some of you are black Christians. Some of you are Asian Christians. Some of you are Hispanic Christians. Those adjectives don't go away. I will always be white and in February nearly see-through. <laughs> and in the summer it becomes salmon. <laughs> Those adjectives don't go away. I'm white, you're black, that can't change but disunity will arise in our midst when we let those adjectives become the nouns. When we allow our blackness or whiteness to overcome our Christianness. Tony Evans says this. The racial application to Paul's teaching here in Galatians 2 is that it is technically incorrect to say I'm a black Christian or I'm a white Christian because you, now you've made black and white adjectives and Christian a noun and the job of the adjective is to modify the noun. So now you've got to keep the Christian looking like the adjective that describes it or it ceases to be Christian. But black and white culture have nothing to do with the essence of being a Christian. We're in an election year, are we not? We all know this. I get the mail every day, sick of it. And I have my very own personal and passionate political leanings. But if I let those adjectives of my political leanings overcome my noun, then I'm wrong. And I'm creating disunity. What the gospel says is we come from wildly different backgrounds, families of origin, jobs, educations, political leanings, income brackets, and colors of skin. But the greater thing is that I and you call Christ king. And if we do that, we share the same baptism, the same gospel, the same Lord, the same kingdom, and the same mission in common. And that overcomes everything else in our life. We have freedom to be unified around the main thing. And here's the main thing. I am more evil than I ever show, and yet I am more forgiven than I could ever believe. If you and I actually believe that, we will be humbled at the foot of the cross, and we will seek the main things together, and everything else will fall into its proper place, which is not salvific. Okay? Freedom for unity. The second thing is freedom for confrontation, freedom to confront. When we are freed up in the gospel, we now have freedom to confront one another. We can call this tender truth-telling, not T-I-N-D-E-R, T-E-N-D-E-R, okay? Tender truth-telling. Okay, and think about this situation here for a second. Peter was kind of the head honcho, right? He was close to Christ. He was kind of the initial pastor. He was the kingmaker of the future pastors. He is, he's the one with, that holds most of the power, And Paul, the one who persecuted and killed Christians, goes and approaches the head honcho and confronts him. Why? Because Paul was bound to God, not the fear of man. So he had no fear in confronting Peter. But here's the deal. In confrontation, friends, we must keep both tenderness and truth-telling in tension with one another. 
We all skew one way or another, right? Some of us skew on the tenderness side, right? What do we do when we, when we skew too far that way? I just wanna be nice at the end of the day, so I'm gonna soften the edges of Jesus and the gospel because I don't want anyone to be mad at me. That's the tender if we skew too far that way. You guys can probably guess where I skew. Too, a little too far on the truth side, okay? And, he, and what happens when we skew too far this way? We don't keep love and grace in mind and we just kind of become mean and harsh because we just want to be right. No matter what, be right at all costs. But the truth is, in the gospel, we should love each other enough and have enough unity and be freed up enough by the finished work of Jesus to confront one another in both tenderness and truth, grace and love, truth coded in love. And here's the deal, guys. When we're talking about confrontation, what we're we're talking about here in this situation is Peter getting the gospel wrong, okay? Okay? Peter was leading people astray. These are big issues. Because I think all too often when when you preach these sermons, I'm like, man, you're freed up to confront. We all go to like the most minor of issues. We're like, oh, I can't wait to bring that one up. And you're like, Travis, I need to have a meeting. I'm like, oh, great, here we go. Right? This isn't a preferential issue. This is a gospel issue at stake. Either belief is wrong or behavior is wrong. And Paul sees that behavior is wrong in Peter. And so he says, man, I got to go confront you. And the end game of his confrontation is not that he would make Peter feel ashamed, not that he would be right. It is ultimately so that Peter would repent and get back in step with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So hear me, when I'm saying we have freedom to confront, I'm not saying we, we get to turn into a bunch of jerks with our antenna up searching for ways to call other people out. But what I am saying, friends, is that we are freed up when you see someone walking in sin or hypocrisy, especially a brother or sister in Christ, you have freedom to go with humility and say, hey, I see something in your life that's out of step with the gospel. Can we talk about that? I'm not coming down on you. I don't want you to feel terrible about yourself. I just wanna have a conversation, which leads to my final point. When we confront, we also, in the gospel, are freed up to reconcile. Freedom for reconciliation. Here's something that's really cool about this whole scenario. In the end, Paul and Peter reconciled. Paul and Barnabas reconciled. I think all too often when we walk through confrontation, we're just like, I said my piece and now I'm bouncing. Okay, especially in the American church, we have a disagreement with someone in the body or something going on in the church, and we're like, I'm I'm out, man. I'm out. Why? Because we're fragile people and we're unwilling to do the work of confrontation and reconciliation, which always work hand in hand. How do we know that the gospel frees us up for reconciliation? The very essence of the gospel is that we were enemies and at that time is when Christ died for us and reconciled us into friends. We were orphans and through his reconciliation we became children. We were in darkness and through his work of reconciliation we came into the light. In Christ there is more mercy in him than there is sin in us. There is more patience in him than there is failure in us. There are more restarts in him than there are turning backs in us. And so if we're going to do the hard work of confrontation, Galatians 6 says we always do it with the goal of reconciliation and restoration. We don't disagree for the sake of disagreements. And in order to do this, church, we must have both the lowest and highest anthropology. Anthropology is just simply being how you view other people. If you have a low anthropology, here's what you expect. People are sinners just like me. They're gonna hurt me, they're gonna fail, they're gonna sin. If my low anthropology is right, and I think it is, then I'm gonna expect hard situations to come my way. But we simultaneously have a high anthropology where we see that those people who sinned against us and we who sinned against them, we are made in the image of God, so it's not worth it to turn our backs on them. Instead, what we should do is seek them in love for reconciliation in the same way that Christ had a low anthropology of us. It took his death to save us, but he also has a high anthropology because he died to bring us into his kingdom. So, 
we have freedom from our in- inconsistencies to have unity as a church, to confront one another as a church, and ultimately to reconcile as a church. And I've saved the main point of this sermon for the conclusion. Why? Because this episode here is just one big tangled mess. And if we're being honest, our lives are one big tangled mess. And our church, cats out of the bag, forever, by the way, is gonna be one big tangled mess. Why? You're here. I'm here. That's enough to know. We got two sinners in this room, and we got more than two. So it's gonna be one big tangled mess, and we're always gonna be in the hard yet godly work of untangling that mess. So what is the main point that we learned from this episode? In the words of Martin Luther, to progress in the Christian life is always to begin again. That's it. Peter failed. Barnabas failed. Paul gave them a warning. And what happened? They started again. They weren't cast out. They didn't leave. They didn't abandon each other. They didn't come to fist fights. They went back to the gospel. Jesus picked them up, dusted them off, and commissioned them again. Today, church, wherever you find yourself, you have the opportunity to begin again. Okay? You may feel abandoned, but in Christ you are loved by God. You may feel condemned, but in Christ you are made spotless and above reproach. You may feel down on your luck, but in Christ you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You may feel neglected by others, but in Christ you are chosen by God and his plans for you are nothing but goodness and mercy. You may feel defeated by temptation, but in Christ you have died to sin's power. You may feel dead and lifeless, but in Christ you have resurrection life coursing through your veins. You may feel like you're not making a difference in this world, but in Christ you are raised with Jesus and you are working out the works he has prepared for you beforehand. You are walking in those. You may feel broken, but in Christ you have been made complete. In Christ you are a new creation. In Christ you are adopted into his family. In Christ you are a partaker in his divine nature. In Christ you are a beloved child of God. So whatever you came in here with, you have the chance to begin again because you are in Christ. Christ. So, what do we do with all of this? What do we do with all of this? The answer is you get before the Lord and you say, am I harboring bitterness? Do I have someone I need to talk to? Do I need to have a conversation? Do I need to reconcile with someone? And what the gospel says is, don't hold that in. Go in love and have a conversation. If you're not a believer, you have the chance to begin today for the first time. You have the chance to turn from your sins and be fully and freely forever forgiven by Jesus and then you just get to join this big tangled mess of a family. And we'd love to have you because guess what? We're all just a bunch of messed up people trying to work out our salvation together. And church, if you call Story Church home, things are always gonna be hard. The answer is not to tuck tail and run when it goes hard. The answer is to press in and seek the growth of one another. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus that through him we always have the chance to begin again. That through him our our fear of man and our hypocrisy and our legalism has been exposed and not just exposed but paid for on the cross of Jesus Christ. And that when we're living and walking uh, In the spirit, God, we now are freed up to be a people who seek unity, a people who seek reconciliation, a people who seek to live out the gospel in both our belief and our behavior. And when we fail, God, forgive us, put us on the right path and restore us, we pray. I pray you would make Story Church into a people who freed up by the finished work of Jesus are settled in our identity that we belong to Christ, nothing else changes that, nothing else modifies that, we belong to Jesus. And because of that, we are gonna seek the best for one another. Because of that, we are gonna pray for and encourage and affirm and walk with one another through the good and the bad, the highs and the lows. God, I pray you would make us into a church like that. In Jesus' name, amen.